Okay, hello everyone. Um, welcome. Today I'm going to talk about uh, a very famous book by Thomas Piketty uh, called Capital in the 21st Century. And uh, probably uh, most of you have already heard of this book. It attracted a lot of attention when it came out uh, in 2014. Uh, so it's already been six years, but this doesn't diminish uh, the importance of the findings in uh, any significant way. If anything, uh, the events of the past uh, intervening six years have simply uh, proven the veracity uh, uh, and importance of Piketty's uh, findings and work. And his basic finding is that uh, inequality uh, has increased significantly uh, throughout the 21st century following a, a U-curve. Uh, so it was very high at the beginning of the 21st century, uh, sorry, beginning of the 20th century and around the time of the Belle Epoque. Uh, and then it declined significantly uh, during World War II and immediately after World War II and then it has slowly risen uh, from that point. And this corresponds, as Piketty shows, uh, to the importance of capital uh, as a percent of national income. So basically, capital is becoming more and more important. Uh, people who own capital, who have a lot of capital, are making more and more money off of it. Uh, inherited wealth is becoming more important. Assets and these types of things, whereas income from labor uh, is holding less and less of a share uh, of national wealth and national income. So this is his basic uh, finding. Um, I'm going to go through the book, though, and talk about uh, each of the chapters in more detail. And in this lesson, uh, I'm only going to look at the first part uh, of the book, or about the first half, roughly. Um, it's quite a long book, as you can see, uh, approximately 800 pages. Um, so it's necessary, especially when looking at this in detail, to divide uh, this talk uh, into two. Um, despite the length, though, it's quite readable. Uh, it's written by a professional economist, of course, but for a general audience, uh, or general enough to the point where if you don't have uh, an advanced background in economics, you can still grasp uh, the fundamentals of the book. Um, and just as a personal aside, I like this book, uh, and I think his writing style and also a uh, very good job on the translation as well by uh, Arthur Goldhammer uh, renders the prose uh, very readable. Um, nevertheless, though, I mean, I don't agree 100% uh, with every point, and some of that might come out uh, in the talk as well. Okay, so let's uh, get started. And I have a, a very uh, rather mundane a PowerPoint here. Uh, it's just black and white, lots of text, uh, so apologies uh, for that, but hopefully I'm able to uh, accurately touch on most of the main points and um, kind of render uh, uh, or make the book more understandable, especially for people who don't have time to uh, read the whole thing. Okay, Thomas Piketty, Capital in the 21st Century. As I just mentioned, um, Piketty's basic arguments, at least in part one, are that capital, um, specifically wealth derived from assets rather than uh, labor, has dramatically increased over the 21st century. Uh, this has resulted in a widening wealth gap, increased in inequality, the undermining of democratic process, uh, etc. Um, basically, it's a great time to be rich, uh, especially a landowner or someone who has a lot of assets. And if you really wanted to simplify um, what the main message of this 
uh, book is, I guess, is that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. So Piketty starts out on page one uh, of the introduction very clearly laying out his thesis, which is that when the rate of return on capital exceeds the rate of growth of output and income, as it did in the 19th century and seems quite likely to do again in the 21st, capitalism automatically generates arbitrary and unsustainable inequalities that radically undermine the meritocratic values on which democratic uh, societies are based. Uh, all spelling errors, by the way, are, are my own, uh, so I take full responsibility for that. Um, he then summarizes his views, uh, or it summarizes the previous views, sorry, I should say, on inequality and scarcity, uh, especially Ricardo, Marx, Kuznets, um, Kuznets, especially he borrows from this, uh, the bell curve and the uh, idea that uh, inequality increases and then decreases following the course of economic development. Um, Piketty actually shows how this, he argues against this and shows how it's not the case. Um, and then he lays out his view uh, in the context of that and his tentative conclusions that the dynamics of wealth distribution reveal powerful mechanisms pushing alternatively toward convergence and divergence. Furthermore, there is no natural spontaneous process to prevent destabilizing inegalitarian forces from prevailing permanently. Uh, and then he, he shows the, the U-curve um, that inequality is increasing. Um, on page 31, for instance, it's inequality in the US uh, where the top decile uh, share of wealth uh, between the 19, from the 1910s to the 1920s was between 45 and 50 percent, so almost half of national wealth was held by the top decile. Um, this decreased then dramatically to less than 35 percent in the 1950s, and now uh, between the 2000s and the 2010, uh, 2010s, it's increased again to about the same as what it was before, uh, between 45 to 50 percent. And Inequality in the U.S. is particularly extreme, uh, but in fact, basically in most rich countries around the world, as Piketty shows, um, they, they display uh, the same uh, patterns and trends. Uh, capital income ratio it also follows a U-curve, so then here he, he contrasts this then or shows how they're uh, directly related to each other, inequality in the capital income ratio. Uh, also follows a similar U-curve around the world so that whereas around uh, 1870 it was uh, six to seven years national income expressed as 600 to 700 percent of national income, um, around 1950 this decreased to two to three years or 200 to 300 percent of national income and now as of 2010 uh, it's back up again to uh, 400 to 500 percent of national income. Um, okay, so uh, and then he gives uh, one of his important formulas uh, that expresses basically what he's been talking about here, that uh, inequality explained as a function of R, which is the rate of return on capital, uh, is greater than G, which is uh, the rate of growth. And he says, when the rate of return on capital significantly exceeds the growth rate of the economy, then it logically follows that inherited wealth grows faster than output and income. So this is very important. Assets, inherited wealth, all these kinds of things. Uh, if you start off rich, you're just getting richer. Uh, and the poor and average working people uh, command less and less of a portion of national income. Okay, so moving on to chapter one, income and output. So here he focuses on the capital labor split as a percent of national income. I've already been talking about this basically, but he goes into more detail here about how he calculates this essentially. Um, and he says, the importance of capital in the wealthy countries today is primarily due to a slowing of both demographic growth and productivity growth coupled with political regimes that objectively favor private capital. Okay, so this sounds pretty straightforward and um, I can already think of a number of, of countries all around the world where this 
pretty much uh, exactly applies. Um, but what is capital exactly? I mean, what does Piketty mean by capital? Well, he explains uh, that what he's talking about is the sum total of non-human assets that can be owned and exchanged on some market. Capital includes all forms of real property, including residential real estate, as well as financial and professional capital, plants, infrastructure, machinery, patents, and so on, used by firms and government agencies. Um, and he uses the term capital and wealth pretty much interchangeably throughout the book. Uh, he goes on to say this is divided into public wealth uh, or capital versus private wealth or capital. So that national wealth equals private plus public wealth. And then importantly also he notes that public wealth in most countries is negative because the debt exceeds the assets. Uh, this is very important. So um, private wealth, as he shows, commands almost all of the percentage of national income, whereas public wealth uh, is a very small percentage of this, uh, and in some cases is even negative. Uh, well, he says this, uh, private wealth accounts for nearly all of national wealth almost everywhere. Okay, and then importantly, he talks about how to measure capital or how he measures capital in the book. And it's basically uh, achieved by dividing the stock of capital by the annual flow of income. This is the capital to income ratio. And he expresses this with the Greek uh, letter uh, beta. So that if a country's total capital stock is, for example, six years of national income, then uh, beta equals six, or beta equals 600%, meaning that its capital is 600 uh, worth, uh, or the amount of capital stock is six years of national income. And then this leads to the first law of capitalism. Alpha equals R times beta. And here alpha is the share of income from capital in national income. How much capital is there? That's what Alpha stands for here, that's what it tells us. Um, R is the rate of return on capital. So, for example, if beta is 600%, uh, capital income ratio is six years of national income, and the rate of return is 5%, then alpha equals R times beta equals 30%. So the share of capital in national income would be 30%. Uh, and then this is capital to labor ratio, so the remaining 70% would be the share that labor holds uh, in national income. And then he talks a little bit about global inequality, um, kind of using this model then. Um, he notes that GDP, for world GDP, which in 2012 was about 700 trillion euros, um, divided by the population, 7 billion, if you just wanted to factor this this out and divide income, you know, per person, per capita, um, minus 10% capital depreciation divided by 12 months of the year would equal uh, a monthly income per person of 760 euros. Uh, if world GDP was uh, divided exactly equally per person, which of course is not, but this is just a hypothetical. Uh, but then he says rich countries, uh, however, are doubly wealthy because they produce more at home and invest more abroad. So national, per, uh, national income per capita is greater than the output per capita. Uh, this is important and it comes up later, um, you know, why some countries are able to go so far in debt and consume so much, uh, even though they don't pr produce that much and still remain very wealthy. Um, and then he notes that convergence theory suggests that capital investment from abroad would hypothetically enrich, uh, enrich in poor countries, but of course in reality this uh, is not happening. Okay, moving on to chapter two, growth uh, illusions, sorry, this should be illusions and realities. Uh, not, not sure why my spell checker doesn't catch these, but whatever. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so he basically says growth is slowing down everywhere. And in fact, as he argues, and he's looking again at long-term historical trends uh, in capital, right, of capital. And he says that actually growth has always been slow, relatively slow 
uh, except for periods of catch-up. And he argues that we're, we've we're, I've already entered a, another low growth phase, so that growth is, is going down, and it's going to be much slower in the future. Uh, but this has a number of consequences then. So uh, the law of cumulative growth, for instance, shows that low annual growth over a long period actually leads to big changes. And this is where uh, Piketty's historical perspective comes in and why his long-term historical analysis is important. And he says, the central thesis of this book is precisely that an apparently small gap between the return on capital and the rate of growth can in the long run have powerful destabilizing effects on the structure and dynamics of social inequality. Um, and then he talks about, you know, growth, right? Demographic growth, uh, especially economic growth, and looks at the trends of these to uh, back up his argument, basically. And for instance, demographic growth over history has followed a large bell curve. Uh, so it was low for most of history, and then there was a boom above 1% between 1915 and 2012, but now demographic growth is returning to zero uh, by the end of the 21st century. And he says, strong demographic growth tends to play an equalizing role because it decreases the importance of inherited wealth. Conversely, a stagnant, or worse, decreasing population increases the influence of capital accumulated in previous generations. This is really important, again, how he connects growth to the rise in capital and, uh, consequently, the rise in inequality. So he's equating here growth, population growth, but also economic growth and the percent that labor holds in national income as playing an equalizing role. Um, and that low-growth societies uh, even if they have low rates of return on capital, where capital is still increasing, then it's going to become much and much more uh, unequal, he says, and that people at the top are just going to sit on their inherited wealth, essentially, that's going to, and assets, that's going to keep accumulating um, profit for them and income. Um, and he says, there's no historical example of a country at the world technological frontier whose growth per, in per capita output exceeds 1.5% over a lengthy period of time. It is important to bear this reality in mind because many people think uh, that growth ought to be at least 3 to 4% per year. As noted, both history and logic show this to be illusory. So here's where that illusions of growth comes in. And as I mentioned, Piketty generally has a positive view of growth then. He thinks people's lives have improved and changed dramatically and um, it's worth pointing out that this is probably much different from historians such as Emanuel Wallerstein, for instance, who have a much less positive impression of historical capitalism and so-called growth under historical capitalism. And I, I think this, you know, maybe could also be problematized a bit from the perspective of environmental damage as well. You know, what does grow, growth under capitalism entail? Um, yes, perhaps, as Piketty says, it has some kind of equalizing uh, effect, uh, but in, in terms of rising wages, right? But it also has a lot of negative consequences as well. Um, and he says then, for instance, also uh, that economic liberalization or interventionism make little difference in the long run, so that these models, these historical trends that he's looking at um, are actually they're exacerbated by, for instance, neoliberal um, reforms and deregulation from the 1970s and 80s, but uh, that, that's not the main cause of this, he says. Um, he looks a little bit also at the effects of inflation on growth. Um, so if the nominal growth rate is 3% per year and prices increase 2% per year, then the real growth is 1%. So you have to subtract uh, the rate of inflation from nominal growth. And historically, this is, um, you know, periods of high inflation, for instance, uh, and some of the effects this has had have been, uh, during World War II, for instance, the belligerents abandoned the gold standard and printed money to pay off debts. So there's very high inflation rates. Um, and similar trends were observed uh, in other crises too, where governments, in order to pay off debts, uh, will just print a lot of money uh, but then inflation starts to rise. Um, 
and also at that time printing a lot of money resulting in high inflation which devalues government bonds and thus wipes out a large portion of capital. So this decrease in capital as we'll look at more later uh, during and after World War II is partly a result of this, of just governments printing money, high inflation, and the rates of, of uh, the interest rates on government bonds then, um, and the rates of return on government bonds basically become so small that they're negligible. Uh, so people holding a lot of government bonds then uh, are, are suddenly left with almost worthless uh, bonds, right? Okay, in chapter three, he gets into the history a bit more uh, of capital, the metamorphosis of capital. Um, it's an attempt that he makes to plot the history of capitalism through the evolution of capital, especially looking at the cases of France and Britain. Um, and some of these numbers we've already looked at, but uh, capital income ratio was 600 to 700% between the 1970s and 1910s. Again, small portion of people at the top have all of the wealth. They're getting all of most of the national income, whereas people working, average working people, are all at the bottom. They have very minimal amounts of uh, wealth. Uh, then there's a huge drop in the 1920s through World War II uh, before rising again to previous levels. Um, there's also shifts that he observes um, from importance invested in agricultural land to housing and other domestic capital. So obviously types of capital, types of assets held change. It's not so much agricultural land anymore. It's more rent from housing and other kinds of assets, especially financial assets. Um, and he says Britain and France in the 1990s and 2000s regained a level of wealth not seen since the early 20th century, and capital seems about to return to levels equal to those observed in the 18th and 19th centuries. So this is, this is a big finding. I mean, this is his main finding, right? Um, and he repeats this point, um, you know, through many times, through many different examples. But he also kind of explains the economics behind this in a very, you know, simple kind of textbook fashion, which is, I guess, helpful, um, you know, for people like me as well who don't have a lot of background in this. Um, for instance, foreign capital, the, the importance and the roles that foreign capital play in this. So a large amount of foreign assets would allow countries to run structural trade deficits and for Britain and France in the 19th century, this came from having a lot of colonies. Um, they owned a lot of capital in other countries. Uh, and he says of this, uh, in other words, the rest of the world worked to increase consumption by the colonial powers and at the same time became, much, uh, became more and more indebted to those same powers. So the harder they work, um, the more they produce for colonial powers to consume. Uh, none of that profit is being returned to them and they just have to work harder and harder. Uh, and then today you could kind of up this, update this, you know, to, uh, to, to today's situation, for instance, uh, in the case of the U.S., which has huge trade deficits, allowing it, allowing it to act as the world's consumer. Uh, meanwhile, Japan has trade uh, surpluses and thus large foreign, current, foreign currency reserves, um, but this is not necessarily a, a beneficial if it doesn't help Japanese people, for instance, improve their livelihoods. Um, so, in some, in other words, in any, uh, in any case, um, Piketty says the metamorphosis of capital shows the increase of private wealth and public debt to Belle Epoque levels. Uh, one is um, one key to this is you know, rentiers who buy government bonds or bu public debt and make money off of the interest which comes from people's uh, taxes, um, and. Again, he notes that public wealth, um, on average, about 5% of national income is insignificant compared to private capital. And this is observed in all rich countries uh, in the world. Uh, one difference from the Belle Epoque was that the inflation rate was virtually zero between 1815 to 1914, and interest rate, uh, the interest rate on government bonds was a high between 4 to 5% so that people could make lots of money from purchasing public debt. Uh, which is not so much the case today. So they own different kinds of assets today. Uh, he continues looking at the history and historical examples uh, in chapter four, from old Europe to the new world. 
And I wanted to state at the beginning that what these historical shifts show is that capital produced through land ownership, capital is produced originally through a land ownership mostly. Uh, so the first tenant farmers are renters. Uh, and then after this though, historically, there's a decline in the importance of agriculture and a move to factories um, based on paying wages and getting profits from surplus labor uh, and houses. So now, um, most of us have to pay rent on our homes. So that we're still basically in a similar situation. Um, people who own the land, people who own the assets are making money off of the people who work and who have to pay rent. Um, he measures flows of capital also in other countries, in Germany, and observes similar trends to France and Britain, and maps out for Europe in general, um, demonstrating uh, high private capital versus low public capital. Uh, and then again goes back, looks at drops in capital due to World War II. Um, I can maybe uh, skip over some of this. Um, and he goes on then to the U.S. Uh, case, and he says, conversely, historically in the U.S., capital was still quite low relative to the income from labor. So this is kind of interesting. He compares the historical case in the 20th uh, century, um, in the 19th, 20th century, between... Um, Europe and the US. And in other words, there was less inherited wealth compared to Europe, so that it, it mattered less. I mean, um, uh, and instead, in place of this, there were more small uh, land or business owners, and in theory, more meritocracy. So capital played less of a role historically in the US. Um, also, there was little foreign capital in the US. Uh, of course, the U.S. not having um, really per se, uh, or at least in the same way uh, as France and Britain uh, colonies uh, around the world. The world of 1913 was one in which Europe owned a large part of Africa, Asia, uh, and Latin America, while the United States owned itself, he says. So um, the United States at this time owned most of its domestic uh, capital, most of its capital was domestic capital, it had little foreign capital, and the situation was kind of much different in um, Europe. Uh, however, capital, U.S. capital grows until it's about equal to 500% of national wealth in 1910. Um, and also then he talks about uh, the particular case of the U.S. There was slavery in the U.S. South. Um, so that there, in the South, there was a high amount of capital. Um, all told, Southern slave owners in the New World controlled more wealth than the landlords of old Europe. And he gives some examples. Um, between 19, uh, 1770 and 1810, the value of slave capital was uh, between 1 to 1 1.5 years national income, and the rate of return on slave capital uh, was between 7 to 8 percent. So... Um, plantation owners own all of this capital, own all of these assets, this human capital, slaves, that they're making money from and, and, and not doing any work themselves and then passing this wealth on. So in the, US, in the South, uh, capital did play an important role. In Chapter 5, he goes more into the dynamics of um, his original formula for the capital income ratio um, and he shows the maps out the capital income ratio over the long run. And he starts out then by um, talking about how this capital income ratio is achieved. Remember, the first fundamental law of capitalism was talking about the percent of capital and national income. And there, he just talked about the capital income ratio uh, without really explaining you know, how it was achieved and where it comes from. So this is the second fundamental law of capitalism where beta... Uh, the capital income ratio equals S, uh, the savings rate, over G, the growth rate. Uh, so that this means uh, that societies with slow or low growth means that, ca that capital there then commands more of a percent of national income and becomes much more important. For example, it could command between seven to eight years of national income. But high growth means that capital would then decrease, um, a high growth over savings rate, right? to maybe three to four percent years of national income. Uh, so for example, say that the savings rate is 12 percent 
uh, then this would be divided by the growth rate, which if this was 2% would be six, where that six means the capital income uh, ratio is six years of national income or 600% of national income. So this would be a very high savings rate, uh, but actually fairly high growth rate as well. Uh, a country that saves a lot and grows slowly will over the long run accumulate an enormous stock of capital relative to its income, which can in turn have a significant effect on the social structure and distribution of wealth. In a quasi-stagnant society, wealth accumulated in the past will inevitably, inevitably acquire disproportionate importance. Um, moreover, uh, G equals the sum of per capita growth rate plus population growth rate, meaning that countries with low growth demographic, or low uh, demographic growth, for instance, uh, in Europe and Japan, will accumulate a greater capital stock. So this is really important, I mean, again, because in our case, in the Japanese case, um, very low growth rate, very high savings rate. So in theory, then, following Piketty's model, uh, capital should be playing a very important role uh, in Japan, and capital should be commanding an ever-growing portion of national income. Uh, next, he measures private capital in rich countries, showing a steady increase from 3.5 years to 4.7 years in 2010. Uh, he notes that Japan and Italy are the highest, so they have the most private capital uh, of rich countries. And that during the Japan, uh, the bubble era in Japan, private capital was around seven years, 700% of national income, but now it's down to around six years, which is still a lot. In any case, the rise of private capital signals the emergence of a new patrimonial capitalism, he calls it. And just to look at some examples, um, he maps out uh, the growth rates and savings rates in rich countries between 1970 to 2010. And I just listed three examples, but he gives a lot more. Um, for instance, in the U.S., the growth uh, rate uh, at around 2.8%, the growth rate in population, 1%, the growth rate per capita in national income, 1.8%, and private savings rate is 7.7%. Um, Japan, on the other hand, has low growth rate uh, in terms of population, at least relatively, um, but has a very high savings rate. And in Britain, um, also low growth rate, uh, but a little bit lower, actually the lowest of these three examples, uh, private savings rate. So capital, following his model then, is going to play the most important role here in Japan. Um, he looks at the private savings in rich countries and kind of uh, details, you know, goes into further detail about these. Um, here, private savings, household net savings, and corporate net savings uh, or net retained earnings. And in Japan as well, then very high savings rate, but uh, a large portion of this is corporate savings as net retained earnings, as profits. Um, and in, in Britain, um, it's a, a bit lower. But household savings is smaller portion than uh, corporate net savings. Um, it could be pointed out that annual capital depreciation is between 10 to 15 percent of national income and that this then mainly applies to um, the maintenance of buildings etc. Um, so that not all of this income from capital is, is retained as earning some of it has to go to maintenance, um, uh, maintaining the assets. Um, but, uh, and then he, he says, um, and, and then this is just an interesting thing to think about, but uh, net savings, capital appreciation then, should increase dramatically with more work from home. And this has been particularly on, on my mind, on a lot of people's minds, I think, because of the COVID-19 uh, crisis, more and more people working remotely, in theory, less overhead costs for companies, and more net savings and capital appreciation then. So they should be making more, uh, at least uh, capital depreciation would, would be less. Um, the increase in private wealth it has been mainly due to slow growth and high savings. So this is summing up his graphs and the, the data 
uh, we looked at in the last slide. Um, but also privatization of public wealth and assets is important, um, especially referring to uh, neoliberal trends in deregulation from the 1980s. Public wealth decreased uh, one year national, uh, between, from one year national income between 1970 and 1910, while private wealth rose to seven years national income during this time. So there's been a, a transfer of public wealth, one year of national uh, income of public wealth to private hands. And I would say this explains a lot for the situation that we find ourselves in today um, in Japan, for instance, as well, where there's, you know, less and less money for public services for and all of these things as well, you know, the post office, um, rail companies, etc., all being privatized. Um, this all fits into this, right? And you know, why is there no money for, why are there no funds to fund public projects? Um, it's because all of that uh, income has been transferred and shifted to private hands. And countries keep borrowing to pay their current deficits, which puts them further in debt and further increases private wealth of individuals and companies. So it, again, it's really the transfer of public wealth to private hands. He also notes um, another reason uh, for the rise of, of capital um, is due to the rise in asset prices, especially stock prices and higher real estate prices. Um, and here kind of related to this, he talks about asset bubbles stemming from um, beta equals S over G. Uh, resulting in an influx of capital. And then this is then invested somewhere like foreign assets or real estate, which is pretty much what happened uh, during the Japanese bubble. Um, but this can cause trade friction and or rising real estate prices, uh, as I noted, both of which were observed in the 1980s Japanese bubble. Um, and then closing the chapter, he predicts um, you know, where the world uh, capital income ratio is going to go in the future. And it shows that it's just going to keep going up. Uh, the graph shows uh, near 500% in 1910, drops down in 1950, but continues rising after that to near 700% by two, uh, 2100, or approximately the level observed in Europe from the 18th century to the Belle Epoque. Chapter 6, and this is the last chapter in the first uh, part of this book, and uh, these are the last slides that we'll be looking at today in this talk. Um, and here he talks about the capital-labor split in the 21st century. And it's an important point that he makes uh, in the beginning of this chapter, and it's important to point out that um, higher rates of return on, that there are higher rates of return on capital when the stock is smaller. When there's less capital, there's higher rates of return on it. This is evidenced in the U-shaped uh, curve of the capital income ratio, um, which when mapped out for R, uh, rates of return on capital alone shows uh, the opposite curve, kind of a, a, a bell curve. Um, there's been a, a general trend, in, so again, you know, we've already looked at then uh, how the types of capital have changed. So there's been a trend toward increased financialization of assets so that now all wealth in rich countries is divided between two types, he says, real estate and financial assets. Um, Basically, uh, the rate of return and uh, the portion of the capital and national income on small nest egg savings on private savings accounts are negligible. And that most of the wealth comes in the form of owned or inherited assets, particularly rent, which uh, he says, quote, accounts for half of total national wealth. This, this is pretty astounding, I think, so I insert a, an exclamation mark here. Um, he gives some, some, you know, goes into some interesting discussion here, which I think is really uh, neat to point out and to think about. Um, how do we calculate rent after all? Well, he says uh, typically rent is between 3 to 4 percent of the total property value. So just thinking of an example here, let's say the property value uh, of a house or a really nice condominium, um, or a pretty nice condominium is about uh, 35 million uh, yen. And this would then be uh, multiplied by 3%. So you get uh, about 1 million uh, 50,000 yen and divide this by 12 months of the year. 
So that rent, monthly rent, then should be, in theory, about 87,500 yen. Uh, Hachiman yen, right? Um, but probably none of us are paying rent that low on such a nice property. So we can already kind of deduce the amount that is taken out for profits, which in this case would be quite a bit, uh, as well as increased rate of return for landowners. Um, okay, but of course, well, we have to de deduct inflation rates from interest rates, you know, the real return on nominal assets, but um, nonetheless, I mean, this kind of example shows, you know, the importance of, of rent and how much is being made on rent. Um, the rate of return on capital is determined by, he says, uh, technology, another spell error there on my part, and the abundance of capital stock, which he kind of talked about the abundance of capital stock here. Um, if there's less capital stock, the rates of return are going to be higher. Um, but another one is, another factor is marginal productivity as the key to determining the rate of return on capital. And he says marginal productivity of capital is defined by the value of the additional production due to one additional unit of, oh, lots of spelling errors here, sorry about that, one additional unit of capital. Uh, basically, marginal productivity equals the number of the new investment, the amount of new investment divided by the total worth or value of the asset, like land or something. So that if a $5 Five dollars of new investment is uh, made be divided by hundred, uh, and it's divided by hundred dollars of total value of the asset or property. Um, there would be a five percent marginal productivity. You invest five euros uh, of capital, and it's able to uh, in a hundred euro property or asset or something, and it's able to um, you know rate increase rates of profit um, by five euros or something, then this would be a 5% marginal productivity. Um, but not all societies work this way. We can imagine, for instance, ancient farming societies had close to zero marginal productivity because no matter how much they invested in the land, it wasn't going to increase the productivity. There was, the technology wasn't there, it didn't exist. Um, so, uh, so in this case, I mean, investing a lot of capital wouldn't have made a lot of, of difference. And this is then relates, of course, to the importance of technology. Um, but it also leads to then uh, some important contradictions. Um, and it starts like this. So that too much capital kills the return on capital, he says. More capital and centralization uh, can lead, for instance, to lower prices, but this simultaneously kills the return on capital. Um, because again, less capital, higher rates of return. Um, and he writes, modern technology still uses a great deal of capital and even more uh, important, because capital has many uses, one can accumulate enormous amounts of it without reducing its return to zero. Under these conditions, there is no reason why capital share must decrease over the long run even if technology changes in a way that is relatively favorable to labor. So his basic argument is, you know, we can return to this low growth society and we won't have to invest as much capital, but um, even, and then the rates of return are going to go down on capital, but over the long run, even if it's low rates of return, if it's in, in the cumulative sense, um, capital is still going to continue to go up and up. Um, and so he returns to Marx here, and Marx uh, predicted that capitalism would dig its own grave because of infinite accumulation or, or over-accumulation, resulting in a falling rate of profit, uh, i.e. return on capital. Um, and Piketty's findings suggest something close to this, so they kind of confirm this, that if S is high, the savings rate is high, and capitalists accumulate a lot, and the capital to income ratio, then the capital the income ratio increases, but if growth is low, uh, and it's the same if growth is low, but as the capital to income ratio gets larger, uh, the rate of returns must also get smaller and smaller. Otherwise, alpha, capital share of income, will ultimately devour all of national income. So this leads to the logical conclusion then, he says, uh, is that 
continual structural growth is the only counter to capital accumulation, uh, i.e. growth is good for labor or increasing labor's portion of national income. Um, but again, I mean, I don't know, I think this could be mm, problematized here a bit. I mean, because as he says, I mean, yes, you can't deny that growth then is, is going to increase labor's share of uh, income and national income, but at the same time, under capitalism, you know, continual growth obviously uh, has a lot of very negative consequences as well if we consider its effects on the earth, for instance. Um, but he also concludes that A, capital is making a comeback and will continue to grow in importance. This is due to low growth regime, including demographic growth. And B, the growth in capital income ratio does not mean that the rate on return, uh, the rate of return on capital will fall because the decrease in the rate of return will be smaller than the increase in the capital to income ratio so that capital share will increase. Okay, and that brings us to the uh, end of this talk. Um, and I've tried to summarize uh, uh, and give a synopsis of uh, the first part of Thomas Piketty's Capital. Uh, again, very interesting book, very important findings uh, for the age we live in, and it goes a long way, I think, to understanding, um, you know, why inequality is getting so bad uh, and why there are then a lot of problems uh, that we see resulting from this. Uh, he hasn't gotten into any of his solutions, what to do about this. Um, again, as I said in the beginning, it's basically an issue of um, the haves increasing their portion uh, and the have-nots, uh, you know, getting an, an ever-increasingly smaller uh, portion of national wealth. Um, so we can already maybe start to draw our own inferences uh, about how to perhaps uh, solve this problem. Uh, but he's going to get into that more uh, in later sections of the book, and I'll talk about those uh, in uh, our next talk. Thank you very much.